Thank you. Welcome to our last colloquium. Thanks to Karim and uh, Cecilia for organizing this and let, letting me do this finally. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us uh, this term, I don't use it often, the real world leader. The world leader for applied mathematics. Uh, why I call him world leader? Well, he was the president of PCM, which is the largest uh, applied math uh, organization in particular. In next week, you're going to somewhere in the US to decide about the next PCM. Uh, in addition to that, he's been fellow of SIAM, AM, as you name any medals, he has got it. But more importantly, his work has uh, been fantastic, as you will see. So it's just strongly supported by mathematical analysis. That's a, that's a crucial game on applied problem with the large scale applications. His papers are long, at least about 25 pages. I haven't seen anybody. So he's got more than 200 publications. Each one has got more than 25, 30 pages. It's a very long one. In particular, recently I finished one and I submitted one and I think they said, that's your undead paper. I said, I'm going to retire now. <laughs> but I don't know how he does it. His energy, enthusiasm is fantastic. So it's a pleasure to have you. <laughs> yes, well, thank you for that excessive introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, I don't like to live up to that, but anyhow, I'm going to talk about something that is a, a recent enthusiasm uh, for us, it's the cosmic microwave background. I saw the title, I might have had it there before. <laughs> Willie tells me that I have got the wrong title. <laughs> no, that was the beast. Uh, but, <laughs> so, joint work with Tom Lazier and Rob Womersley at the University of New South Wales and Ngong Wong who is, actually will be at the University of New South Wales in a, in a month or so. He was my student, but he's probably now coming back as a postdoc. Uh, so I will begin by showing you the picture. Now this is a picture of the cosmic microwave background, and I hope you find all this as fascinating as I do. Now I'm going to tell you what it is, but Lewis will tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm not an astrophysicist, and I'm not presenting from the point of view of astrophysics. But, you see, that's a, that's, a, that's a map of something on the sphere. It's a fantastically detailed map of something, yes? I mean, it's incredible. It's, um, it, so, okay, so it's, it is the, well, it's, the, it's, it's this background, um, it's the radiation that comes in from all directions, discovered in the 1950s. It's the microwave, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, it's a black body radiation for a temperature now, I think they say 2.75 degrees. Now originally this, you see it, it's, it, it's black body, but it's very cold because of the expansion of the universe. That's the, that's the interpretation. It's been traveling for a long time. And this, it tells us something about the state of the universe 300,000 years after the, after the Big Bang. And that's the time when the atmosphere when the, became became transparent to photons, so the photons could start traveling and reach us. So this has been traveling ever since, but the universe has been expanding, the wavelength is getting longer and longer. But it, is, it comes in different frequencies, and apparently they tell me it's very perfect black body, that is, it has the, the Planck black body spectrum of a very low, a very low temperature. This is, this is a map of the temperature of well, the temperature is almost constant, but this is the anisotropy, and uh, this is the variation that is of tremendous importance for cosmological interpretation that is not constant, and they want to know what it is like. So, uh, Lewis, yeah. how am I doing? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, that picture comes from the recent Planck satellite, which is a European collaboration. The latest satellite, uh, Lewis worked on the Kobe, if I said correctly, maps and so on. And, and uh, they, they, here they're particularly interested in this small angular variation they, they're calling of anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background. The consortium produced four maps. It's all, I don't think I've given the, the reference, but this is all on the, on the Planck Legacy Archive. If you look for that, search for Planck Legacy archive, you will find it. And so Smiker is one of the four maps, I won't give the other names, they're not very meaningful. They've been, they've been, the, the four maps have been put, cleaned up and produced by different groups. These are different groups that use different technologies. And we're just looking at one of them. And 
Uh, you might say I'm more interested, this is not intended as a contribution to astrophysics so much, we're looking at it as a, as a very interesting thing to try approximation on because it is so complicated. The data, well, I didn't say this, they have been cleaned up because the observations are, 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 are complicated and fused by all sorts of things. There are, there are bright radio uh, objects in the sky and in particular uh, uh, the, there is the, we are looking out from within our galaxy which unfortunately is rather murky, our galaxy, it's a lot of the interference. So in the galactic plane, if I go back to the galactic plane, this has all been cleaned up, but not perfectly as you can see, because you can still see the sign of the... So is that, that map has the dipole and the monopole subtracted? Yes. Do they also, do they also subtract the particle? I don't believe so, but you're asking me perhaps more than I know, but I know all, all the maps have the monopole. The monopole, exactly. the monopole of the apex, essentially, so I mean, so it's the, uh, it's this, what this, originally it was, I remember it as the four degrees, like, like which was originally four degrees? 2.7. 2.7, I, I, yeah, I, okay, I have the wrong number. In my, it's Kelvin, it's quite cold. Uh, but anyhow, so... Um, uh, so monopole is subtracting? The, the monopole is subtracting, the dipole is subtracted because we are moving, well, the galaxy, well, I suppose the galaxy all is moving, is that the point? Yeah. Well, we're moving with respect to the reference frame, right? We're moving with respect to the reference yeah, frame, and that gives the Doppler. The Doppler should shift, and yeah, they take out the, well, the that's, Doppler. That's why I was asking, because the quadruple has a kinematic effect, and then there's a cosmological quadruple. So I don't know if they subtract the kinematic quadruple. Yeah, you have certainly gone beyond my, my ability <laughs> that is here. I'm so glad I gave a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I gave one hour to do is still he has more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so here we are. So, now the data, I mean, it's very interesting from, a, from the point of view of mathematical technology that's gone into this. It's given at what I call the heel picked points, which I will explain uh, in a moment. The heel picked points, hierarchical, equal area, isolatitude, pixelation. But just look at the numbers here. So, that picture I showed you is at resolution 2048. What does it mean? Well, in, in, the simplest thing to say about it is that this, this is mapped at 12 times 2048, which is over 50 million points. And so that's, that's, the data is there on the archive. You can just read it off and put it out. Now, how do you to work with anything at that scale? Well, that will come to be seen. These are marvelous sets of points, and I will try to explain them just by looking at this picture. So if, you, if you look, they're hierarchical. So the first one, I think it's called level zero, has 12 points. The second one is 12 times 4, the third 12 times 4 squared, and so on. And this is 12 times 4 to the something, which somebody will tell me if they're clever enough. <laughs> but, uh, but now, so this is the first one, it has 12 points. And I'd like to sort of show you how it goes. It's actually made up of areas, not of points. The points are not hierarchical, the areas are. The, the partition of the sphere is, is hierarchical. So, so that's the North Pole. It took me a long time to figure this out, actually, because they never approached the North Pole. This is the North Pole. That, that's point up there. And then there are one, two, you can see two patches up here. There's a dot in the middle. Right? And then there are two just around the other side where you can't quite see. So around the pole, have I got four fingers? Yeah. There are four areas. They're spread out, they're going down, reaching the equator. There are four from the South Pole, and then there are four middle regions, like this. They're all the same area, and, uh, okay, so then what is done? Well, it's done in a clever way that they divide each area into four, like, to make sure they all have to be served the same area, so it's it, so not quite as involved in the geology, of course, but to get this one, they've divided well, maybe you can pick out the square, you can see it's been divided into four equal area pieces. So there's level one. I think that's level one. Uh, by the way, there is a Helpix primer on the web. If you're really interested to know about this, Helpix primer. Easily found. There it is. There it is. So uh, don't trust me, trust the thing. But you see, it's hierarchical 12, 48 whatever that is, number that is, 196, and multiplied by 4, and each time 
the area is divided, so that's hierarchical equal area. E, uh, and the A, I go to the A, what is it called? What is the A? Oh, equal area, yeah. Okay. And the L is the ISO latitude. And the points the point are on rings. It's not so obvious yet. But at each level, you know, I mean, at each level, they, are, they come on, on the, equal, the, the points are on a number of different rings. They're equally spaced on rings. And this is enormously important for computational harmonic analysis because, well, you know, spheric harmonics, we know that spheric harmonics take to e to the i in phi around, so they're, they're very easily computed. That's fast Fourier transformable. You see, the, the, the work is done by fast Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. This wonderful technology that is in this Hilpix package, because it does harmonic analysis as well as fine points. It's phenomenal, I think. And you have done 2,000 levels. Then the area... No, not you, you know, that's to the end of side, it's the number of sides. It's so how many levels? I have to go 11, 12, 13, I have to go. So the area is about 10 to the minus 2 of each pixel? I mean, there's, a, there's one point in each subdivided area. It's yes, well, I mean, in the original picture, there were 50, 50, over more than 50 million points. It's, and they're all each the points, how do they choose the points? Well they're more or less in the middle and always on lines of you know equally spaced Is it the FFT uh, maybe let's say later to the base two only you need? Yes. Two otherwise? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's always it's always uh, hot, hot. yes. Yes, because it starts that way. You see there are oh, uh, four points on each. It starts with four on the on the, on the ring and so on and I'm sure it just you know of course, you, you have it divided to four, but linearly you divided to two, so I'm sure it's all the MFT is two. So I spent some time on this because I, I think one of the things you will be interested in, I know you're going to is, is just the technology here. It makes it practical to work with, uh, with, with uh, spherical polynomials, and we will do it. We will do it with this calculation up to degree 4000. You can do with this number of points at this level, you can do. With reasonable accuracy, uh, I said, let's say the test is with our, with our polynomials up to degree 4000, we can harmonically analyze this whole thing and recreate the map. It's very smooth, it's more it's close to machine accuracy. So you could say that is a 4000, equally, you could say that's a 4000 degree polynomial there. 4000 degrees, that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. no, we never thought such things were possible until they did it. Okay, so is it a realization of a Gaussian random field? This is of great interest in the theory, in the cosmological theory, because according to some theory, it should be a one realization of what is essentially random, but isotropic Gaussian random fields. Isotropic, same in all directions, because the random field is supposed to be invariant under rotation. In a Gaussian random field, to explain the field at each point on the x, I'll call it, the x on the sphere. Each point on the sphere is a Gaussian random variable, and the probability distribution, Gaussian things, is completely determined by knowing the mean, the first and second moment, the mean of the field, I love it. It's always, you know, I would say it's zero. Well, of course, it, you know, one I'm not saying it in the zero, zero. The covariant function, uh, which is the expected value of Tx, T y, I've taken out that, remember we have mean zero for x and y. So, so is it like that? Well, it looks pretty much like it. I mean, to the, to the eye, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm and it assumed that it is a realized, one realization of Gaussian random field. That is the fact that it looks like that rather than some other realization why that cosmological theory is just a matter of accident. It could have just as well been, it could have, could have been rotated, for instance, it could have been completely different. Does yes, the mean have any connection to the monopole at all? Why don't we ask so Lewis? The, the monopole is, is, is just the, the mean of the particular organization. But if you look yeah. at the random well, field right. and the monopole, it's also had mean zero. But it would be nice to have the mean to be taken mm. as. Yeah, but one is the, this, the particular is kind of yeah. random, it's fixed. That's right. You can see a random field is. Oh, yeah, that's right. Essentially, since we're going to take out the, the zero, we will assume 
I mean, if we wanted to simulate it, we would leave out L equals zero and L equals one. We would leave out the one of the dot. I mean, it, uh, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So, okay. So, we now need to know about the Fourier representation because that's what that's the technology that I'm going to talk about. I'm particularly interested in. It fits fantastically well with the objects where we work, it's not the only way of representing a field. This is one way of representing a field on the sphere in terms of spherical harmonics. And I imagine that some of you know these things very well and others of you don't know it at all. So I will, you know, briefly try to talk about what it's about. So the way I live in the, in the physics of a complex, uh, it's an orthonormal basis for the space of homogeneous harmonic polynomials of degree L. Uh, restricted of course to the unit sphere. And uh, <coughs> yeah, well, maybe I'll say a little more about the polynomials later, but you know, to think that so for fixed degree L, the space of polynomials on the sphere is a dimension, it's a finite dimensional space of dimension 2L plus 1. 2L plus 1. So M runs from minus L to plus L, that gives you 2L. The, the numbers. So these sort of don't, in a sense, there's the arbitrary there. But, but, but it's for a given L, a set of YLMs is an orthonormal basis for this 2L plus 1 dimensional space. Yeah, orthonormal with his, in the L2 sense. And so this is, a, this is like a Fourier series. Think of it, I would always call it a Fourier series. And, and so it's like a Fourier series, and the ALMs and the YLMs are orthonormal. So you can pick off, pick them off this way, and uh, with uh, so and, and when we'll take L in practice as large as four thousand. If four thousand, you see the number of coefficients is then the number of coefficients is, is for degree L is 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 L plus one squared. Uh, up to degree L, I should have said, up to degree, up to degree capital L, is L plus 1 squared. So up to degree 4,000 is 4,001 squared, which is a bit more than 16 million. The number of, number of coefficients is just extraordinary. And we will compute yes. Is there a simple way to collect this two numbers which you had? 2,048. Yeah, yeah. The 2,048, uh, this is just a power of two, I think. No, they, is it a power of two? It is a power of two. It is two to the twenty. Oh, two to the twenty. Two to the twenty. So oh. that's four to the ten. Yeah. So there's a, I think there's this hill fix yeah. level to level. No, no, two to the level, sorry. Two to the level. Two to the I think it's one. Well, it's one. One. Two to the Okay, now I, now I want to talk about sparse regularization. Now, let me just change a change focus here a little. So we've got data, from my point of view, represented by 16 and something million uh, coefficients, the complex, but actually the number of independent ones is, is 16 million. So that's a lot of data, and so people in other fields, in compressed sensing and so on, compressed sensing is all about taking data represented by large numbers of uh, large numbers of coefficients and representing it more sparsely. So sparse representation in, in computational mathematics is a hot topic. It, by the way, is yet another subject in which I'm not in any way an expert. So you may assume that I'm not an expert in anything in this <laughs> close to true. And, but it's a very important area, sparse representation. And so in the cosmic, now I come back here to the CFB, cosmic microwave background, in this context, Fast representation have been used, they're controversial. Controversial, I think, and not liked very much for very good reason. And so I'm going to nevertheless look for sparse representation, and that's really the reason why I think this is not really of great interest in astrophysics. I think astrophysicists don't believe in it, because, well, we'll talk about this in a, in a moment. And often discussed has been used particularly for in painting, in painting. If they cut out a section around the equator, then you, you want to maybe paint it in again, and so they may use in painting technique from image processing. Another subject about which I know remarkably little. <laughs> I'm champion for this, actually. So, what, what spurred our attention to this is that in a recent paper 
uh, two Italians, Camarota and Marinucci, who ascended and criticized a particular sparse represent regularization method, representation method, for the CMB data, represented by spherical harmonics. And this, they considered a particular scheme and showed there is no group. I'll cover that in the next session. Uh, but this is the scheme. So I, I want to tell you about the scheme. So, so here is our field. This, this, T, T O is the observed. I, we use that notation in the paper. Of course, it's not the observed. It's the cleaned up, cleaned up field. But it's our initial field. I'm going to consider approximating that field by the saw, saw the T O, over observed by something by T. And we're going to choose that by by minimising this function. So it contains the L two norm of the. Well, of the, it's an L2 thing here, the discrepancy. You want to make it as close as possible in the capital L2 sense. That's uh, thought in their, their thought. Uh, together with the second term, which is the sum of the absolute values of those ALMs. And uh, it, it, well, the way to, to think about this is that, that this is uh, it's an L1, little L1 minimization. It's like you can, you can express this, trying to minimize all this thing is, is equivalent to minimizing this term, it's an L1 term, subject to some condition, some quadratic condition over here. That's very closely related to L1 minimization. Um, and the lambda in there is a parameter which you, which you have to choose, it's a big subject how to choose that, but then we just assume that somehow you choose that. And I, I want to Maybe not so clear in the notation of T, the ALMs are the coefficients, Fourier coefficients of T. So we're trying to, we're going to now juggle these, we're going to move these coefficients away from their original values, which are ALM O. We move them away from the original thing by minimizing this thing. So I don't know how much you know about L1 minimization. Uh, I also know nothing about this. But, but I, I, I thought it would be useful just to compare with what is the standard sort of ticking off kind of regularization in which you put, um, you put a square over here. So this is the standard sort of thing used in inverse problems. This is not an inverse problem, it's an approximation problem, but you know, it's a, it's a standard thing to put in a, 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 a thing like this over there. And so this then is related to, 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 to L2 minimization and constrained L2 minimization. And I thought, well, so uh, I, maybe I could just draw, draw a picture here. The, 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 the important thing about L1 minimization is it leads to sparsity. Is it, I don't know if it's immediately clear, but the reason is sort of, so if I take a two-dimensional minimization problem, and I want to minimize the distance from the origin, subject to lying on the point lying on some curve or something like that. Well, okay, so if I use, a uh, bit colored chalk, if I use L2, then you know that, oh, can I draw this one? Yeah, there, going on, that touches there. Yeah, that, 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 this is the, L, the little L2 minimizing point that you have there. But the one that for, uh, L. I think I dropped the color, but anyhow, L1. <laughs> so you're going to give me thank you, Richard. Thank you, it's wonderful. So it, it's going to it's going to touch here, and it, it almost automatically minimizes at a vertex because of the shape of the unit ball. Right? So this is constant L1 distance from the origin, and you see, and now you've got sparse. So you get sparsity because of the shape of the unit ball. Okay. Any optimizers here like to correct me? <laughs> I've never understood it when other people show this diagram. I've never understood it, but now I understand it. <laughs> well, we use an inverse theory a lot. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Standard. Yeah, it's standard. That, I mean, there's also L0 minimization, which is, but this is not, it is uh, L0 just to minimize the, uh, you, you, you maximize the number of zeros. I think that, no, that's not so easily implementable. This is easily implementable. Well, I have a curious question. In this context, what is the physical interpretation of having a set of uh, sparse coefficients 
in this case? Well, there are several. There are several. Oh, I'm going to come to that. Why don't we just defer yeah. that for a moment? So, Camerata, Camerata and Marinucci showed that the observed, if the observed field is Gaussian and isotropic, so the two things we're interested in one is randomness, and the other is is whether things are isotropic, the same in all directions or in some sense. Well, isotropic, well, that meaning that the underlying law is invariant under rotation. Invariance under rotation is a central idea in physics. The whole universe is thought to be, except for local things like our galaxy, is supposed to be the same in all directions. Well, if they, they, so they show that even if, <laughs> that even if the observed field is Gaussian, but isotropic, then the resulting regularized solution is neither Gaussian nor isotropic. But they sort of left it at that. I'd like to just spend a moment talking about the Gaussian aspect of it. If we start with a random, a Gaussian random field, then it's a consequence of that that the ALMs are also Gaussian random variables. Also Gaussian random variables with some prescribed dis distribution. They're not necessarily independent, but they're Gaussian random variables. And that means that they well, on the other hand, if you make if I make half of them zero, then they're certainly not Gaussian because I, because because they they've got to have you know it's possible to have all of the numbers and they cannot have any numbers. So it's clearly not any regularization scheme will destroy the Gaussianity in, in this context, in this setting as far as the harmonics. So in a certain sense, that's I reckon that's a sort of trivial trivial result that one. But the isotropic, well, they show it's not isotropic in some way, uh, and I will talk about the isotropy. So where we're going is that what, where we started on this is I thought, I thought, you know, I was brought up in physics, but I thought that this way is completely stupid way of doing things because it will destroy isotropy. So I, I would just like to sort of develop this from a... Uh, so how to get rotation invariant? So, so this is a proposition which... I, I think is known to almost all physicists, you know, I mean, intuitively or rigorously or whatever. The, the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the Fourier coefficients for a given L, for a given degree, is rotationally invariant. And that means that if I change, if I just, see, from a physics point of view, you want to say, well, look at my x, y, z axis, x, y, z axis. These ways, I got with axes like that. The physics ought to be the same if I use axes like this, or like this, any, any way of rotating the axes. So rotational invariance is absolute key in quantum, quantum mechanics. And I believe now in, in cosmology that you want rotational invariance, you want independence of how you choose the axes. So this is this is how I claim is rotational invariance, and I will give a proof. But um, because it's just, a, you know, it gives us a sort of feeling of how to go. So rotation invariance formally means that the following, for an arbitrary rotation rho, the rotation in, in, in three dimensions is signed by a three by three orthogonal matrix with determinant one. Yes, that's three. Three by three orthogonal matrix with determinant one. But if, you're, if I rotate, so R is a, is a rotation of a point. It's a, it's a matrix, you may say, that rotates vectors in some direction. And uh, then the, the claim is that, uh, well, and I define it, I'll come back to the definition in a moment because I'm not sure that these things are sort of so well known. It's good, it helps to think about it properly. But so the claim is that, it, that the sum should be invariant under rotation. M, the, the T should be the same as the rotated field T for any rotation. That's the claim. And maybe I should just show you what it means. Uh, Then blackboard to work on it. I maybe don't mean need much. He said in two dimensions, in two dimensions, we're dealing with a field whose randomness is not important at this moment. It's only the fact that it's a two-dimensional field, so x and y, and on the yeah, you know, so I'm going to pick a a nice simple function. This looks like this. It's, it consists. Zero always everywhere except for a bit over here. And now I'm going to take a row to be a positive rotation by, by pi on two. So each point had rotate 
I mean, if this rotation acts on vectors, rho acts on the and one rotation acts on vectors and rho acts on vectors to rotate them by 90 degrees this way. Yeah? But this is a function. What about a function? How do you define what happens to it? A function. Well, that's, that's the way you define what it does for a function. Rho induces a rotation on the function. This R rho t is a new function. So R rho t, what it, what it looks like is is so it's just rotated around here, it's rotated it this way. And I just want to check that that's right. So this is R rho. What I've drawn now is R rho of t. R rho of t. It's around here. R rho at this point, by that definition, is t at rotated by 90 degrees the other way. That's that way. So it's that. So I've got it right. I've drawn the right picture for rotation by, not by pi on 2. So this is our row of t. It rotates, it's the induced rotation of the function due to the rotation row. And I want to say also that when you think about rotation, sometimes it's easier to think about rotating a point. But often we want to rather think every rotation like this is equivalent to rotating the axis the other way. I can picture a rotation by rotating the function, or I could equally hit it now by rotating, by, by rotating the axes. And so this is really about invariance under rotation of the axes. Okay, so I'll show you, I mean, so the theorem is, is I just showed so that, you know, it's sort of easy to do. Well, we've got the ALM, we've got a formula for them, the integral, so this is now a double integral. And, and here at this point, we've got the YLM, X, YLM, and X prime. So, Remember, the central tool in all working with spherical harmonics is the addition theorem. The addition theorem says that well, the sum of m's of y l m x y l m x prime is is a Legendre polynomial. See, how do, how do you know? Well, you prove that it's invariant under rotation, and then you choose the axes to make the proper calculation simple. So, so this is this is fantastically fundamental, you know. So, so that, that, that's what this sum is, it's a, double, it's a double integral of that. So if I take the rotated field, it's the same thing, except I've got the rotated field in here, and the rotated field by definition is less than of rho to the minus 1x. And now we change variables. I change to a new variable, rho to the minus 1x prime, rho to the minus 1x. I change rotated variables in my thing. And I use the invariance of the inner product, and I use the invariance of the measure. And the, you know, this is the fundamental business about, about invariance. And so I come back now with new variable z, z. I come back and I've used the invariance of this inner product. So I get exactly the same expression. So I'm back to so it was it is invariant, fundamentally important, and so thus completing the proof. Now you asked you asked about the physics. Well, L1. We, we, the physics oh, so you're moving away from L1, so that's fine. Yeah, so I'm moving away from L1. So, um, so uh, let me just introduce this notation, because this is what we've shown as rotation invariant. So the, 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 the square root of the sum over M for a given L, for a given degree, and we've shown that it's rotation invariant. And so what we do, what we, we decided to do, it seemed, sort of, it seemed to be an obvious thing to do, actually, from a physics point of view, if you want to do this at all, and have to do this, but if you want to take L1 regularization, you want to get sparse regularization, we take within a given degree, we use the L2 structure, and between degrees, we use the L1 structure. So if I, if I didn't have a square root like this, it'd be ticking off, and it wouldn't give you any sparse, it would not give you sparse. So we put that in there. So now, uh, there's another way of writing it, right, in terms of AL, big AL. And, uh, yeah, so, so that's what we, that's, that, that was our approach, and then my, I thought it was obvious that this is in you know, the preserve rotation invariance. And this is a little more technical to, to get to. My colleague said, prove it, you know, so we had to prove. So now I won't, yeah, that minimization problem is essentially sort of, it's a, you could say it's a student exercise, especially if you use real coefficients. It's a student exercise, and I won't go through it, I think it's just boring. So the regularized minimization problem 
So now I've got new coefficients, right? This is still just a Fourier series expansion, but with new coefficients. And so I hope you're just happy to believe me for a moment. It does give you a sparse representation because it gives you if so if if a l zero, so that's just the square root of the sums of the squares of the input spheric uh, Fourier coefficients. If that's if that's if, 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 if lambda is bigger than that, well, and I always less than lambda, then you, then you don't you have zero. So that's that's sparsity, right? And, and on the other hand, all the other the coefficients which are not, uh, which are which, for which uh, a or o is bigger than lambda, uh, are not killed, but they are reduced. They are reduced by this factor, right? That's the input, and they're reduced by this factor one might. They produce linearness here, just depending on the size of, well, inversely, if you like, 1 minus n by a zero L. And so, in the end, uh, the sparsity depends very much on how you choose lambda. Well, there are ideas about how to choose lambda, one, and we talk about some in the paper, but the, the most important thing is to look at it. So, I show you first now the observed spectrum. So, that's the spectrum we got from Smoker. So, and that's a fantastic calculation for which I'm not, not seeking applause. I wanted to tell you that the technology is there to do it. And it is amazing. I would never have believed that, that you can do that. You see, to get this, to get this for a function of L from 0 up to 400, well, we agree that L equals 0 and 1 are not here, but that's obviously you can't see that. Uh, but, so, we, we obtained these 16 something million. Uh, coefficients and then and, and added up form for each L did the sum over M of these two L plus one things. Square end of the square root. And this uh, this this then is the result. This is closely related to the I guess the square of this is the is the well is the realization of the seal of the of the angular of the angular power power spectrum. And the, I mean the, the this is what we get from the map. This is not necessarily what they think is reality, but nevertheless, it, it has some. I mean, the features that, of course, are what people really are interested in, which are these ups and downs in the in the in the spectrum. And uh, so, so that's how it goes. And if somebody well, it flattens out in this model, which, in this picture, which is a bit strange, is it? But this is on ten to the minus four, ten to the minus five, ten to the minus six. It's on in the degrees going up to four thousand. Now. Um, we, we get you get sparsity, and you cut off depending on where you set lambda. So, well, we decided we did some experiments. We set lambda here. This is the same picture, just in a different vertical axis. The same blue picture. But if we set lambda here, this value, then we cut off from about here up. And this is the this is the regularized the regularized spectrum up there. I noticed. Up there, there's a regular spectrum that is the red, and then this is there with two different sparsity levels. You see, we, what we've done is in the magenta line here, we've just taken just a fair little bit lower, and now, and now you have hardly any sparsity. Sparsity is about 90 percent. For the other case, for the slightly the largest, then we've got sparsity of 70 percent, so which is well, I mean, it is interesting. We do have sparsity, and uh. These nice pictures. Because of course, how they happen to be treated depends on how large were the ALOs, and that's, I mean, from a point, theoretical point of view, it's, it's a matter of how they happen to come in the in the in the random distribution. So, they're random, but they're random. But they're sort of systematic. It's I mean, the angular, the true angular power spectrum is sort of something like this, different the top, but the so, so I will just try to say now, just very briefly, what it is that we actually have to prove at the end of all of this, having done the construction. So the thing we wanted to prove, the thing we claim, I thought was obvious at the beginning, is that you preserve that this thing preserves isotropy. That's a rather technical thing actually to do. So a random field, like in definition, is said to be strongly isotropic. Is it nothing to do with Gaussianity. If for any, any k, any number of points, x1 to xk, 
and any rotation rho, the point set T looked at jointly in all these points, T X1, T X K, and the corresponding T and the T at the corresponding rotated points, if you will, or present in terms of the rotation operator. But these have this set and this set have the same law, same probability law, of the same joint distribution for any K of the same joint distribution. And uh, that's you know, in the abstract, in, that, in a strong sense, that's, that's what you prove. If you've got that in, in, so what our theorem is, that our, if our observed field is, if TO is strongly isotropic, then the regularized field is also strongly isotropic. And uh, I thought now, to, uh, this is slightly difficult to prove, I won't, I won't prove it in full. I thought this morning I should try and give at least some idea of the of the what, what one needs to think about in the proofs. So it's just a couple of slides. But a key is one key is to know how the spherical harmonics behave under rotation of the coordinate system. Now the point to think about, as I said before, that for a given degree, the spherical harmonics of a given degree, the two L plus one lot form, <coughs> well, they actually all, they, they, they are the basis for an orthonormal basis for a two L plus one dimensional vector space. But if I rotate the coordinate system, they get mixed up. Because you know, I mean, they depend on how you choose the axis and so on. So, but how do they get mixed up? Well, they get mixed up this way. So R root on YLN is is some matrix in here, it's a Wigner matrix actually. From a physics, from a nuclear physics point of view, it's a, it's a Wigner matrix, but actually, it, it's, it's a, obviously it's a matrix, you know, because it gets, they get mixed up. And it, it's, it's an orthogonal matrix, because the basis, the old and the new bases are both orthogonal. So it's an orthogonal matrix. And it's 2L plus 1 by 2L plus 1, and, and actually the details, well, the details depend on the definition, precise definition of how you do that. And this is done in different ways, in different parts of physics. <laughs> Not quite the same in astrophysics, as in geophysics, as in nuclear physics. <laughs> Wikipedia is enough to make it tired just by reading the article on the choice of those things. And, but it doesn't matter, we don't need the matrices. What we just need to know is that the spherical harmonics transform like this under rotation. Then, correspondingly, the ALM, the Fourier coefficients, are going to transform. Do you remember there in the definition? So I, I don't really need to go into detail. But this is the new. They have the same matrix, or perhaps the edge of the matrix. So it, uh, and they transform the same way. The new Fourier coefficients, m running from minus l well, are just just the ring matrix applied to them. This is this essentially a sort of trivial difference. But then, so you see this theorem combines both isotropy but also randomness. And so if T is a random field, then these things are ALMs are random variables. They're not independent random variables, but they're random variables. And if the field is strongly isotropic, there's the input field, then the set of all these ALMs and the set of all the rotated ALMs, for all L and M, have the same joint distribution. Baranucci and Piccardi have shown that if a field is strongly isotropic, then this goes this way, and these things all have the same joint distribution. And we actually proved in the paper the converse to go back the other way, that if you if these things have the same law, then then, then their field is strongly isotropic. Oh, the details of this don't matter. I just wanted to give a brief flavour of the sort of things we, we need to worry about in this. And uh, so we have proved in the end that a strongly isotropic input field is a strongly isotropic regularised field. In, in front of D, yeah. we normally have in physics uh, negative 1 to the power m plus m dash, you know, the, that, uh, in particular for rotation, that's Substantially important. I mean, it's not necessary here, I suppose. In computation, it was necessary, you know, um, a while back when I was doing all of this. Yeah. yeah. You, you touch on, of course, the, 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 the difficulties about yeah. 
about about phases, yeah. um, about the precise way in which the these things behave under in relation between the plus M and minus M. <laughs> You'll be very pleased I don't tell you about <laughs> about any more about that. In fact, I've already finished what I was going to say. I, I wanted to show you that, I mean, in a certain sense, now I haven't claimed that this is of interest to astrophysics because the fact that you are the physics, we do preserve the isotropy, which is one essential property, but we have lost the Gaussianity that was there. And so, you know, that, that way I can't recover. There's no way it's past representation to cover that. But I, I just want to finish with looking at how it works. We have some theorem about approximation, but it's, it's a more important, more interesting to look at the results. So this is the regularized map with the one with the most sparsity, the 72% of the most sparsity. And uh, it's regularized here. Well, I, I suppose I should, yes, I should, I should uh, just say that we have, well, you, you will have noticed that all the Fourier coefficients get dragged down, not only those that get zero, the red points are always below, right? and that means that the L2 norm is dragged down only by 20% and so on, and we have 10%, so we have adjusted it by multiplying those Fourier coefficients up to preserve the same L2 norm. And then more of this trigger, it's not actually not that important in, in the result, but at least the color density and so on remains the same. And that to your eyes no doubt looks like the original one. And in fact, it's not so different. It's, uh, it has, uh, these are errors, but on a, a one-tenth scale, the errors that most of the errors are particularly concentrated along here, which is, is uh, we're talking to Lewis the other day, I made the point that the, the quality of the fixing up, the in-painting, or in the middle, seems to me surprisingly poor, because you know, forget what is it? Forget everything I've said. You just look at this. This this is the error in an approximation scheme. And if it was a sensible approximation scheme, what this is telling us is that this was not only big but also rough. This whole area is very rough, hard to approximate. And why it should be like that after all this cleaning up, I don't understand. I will try to get more insight. But anyhow, so so there we are. That's the. It does, it does work if we use the other, re I don't show you anymore, but if we use the, the, the less sparse regularization, the result's almost the same, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, greatly differ. And so just to summarize, we, we have proposed a sparse regularization scheme <coughs> for fields on the sphere represented by a Fourier series. It's a hybrid of L1 and L2 thinking, which seems to us appropriate because within a given degree we preserve we use the L2 to preserve rotational invariance, and within the between degrees we use L1. And the scheme does formally preserve strong isotropy uh, for what that's worth. And the input random field is strongly isotropic, and so too is the regularized field. And that's the reference which is recently submitted is now on the archive. But not on the astrophysics part of the archive, it's in the math part of the archive. So thank you very much for your attention.